the fucking roof. All right. All right. <laughs> Russ Mohammed. <laughs> thanks for dropping. <laughs> thanks for dropping by. Uh, thank you, man. The Bali thank rooftop. Yeah, so we thank just you for uh, the opportunity. Oh, all good, man. Like. I can finally relax and have a whiskey. Where, like right. I, I find it, I hate it because when the when we get an artist on the rooftop, uh-huh. I just want to have a chat and catch up. But okay. I'm so stressed about making sure it all works. All right. That like it's not until it's over that I'm like, okay, I can breathe now. <laughs> it's one of the rare moments. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is actually the first time we've done this. Like I've set up a podcast here afterwards, ah, nice. which is kind of nice. It's like under the rooftop yes. sort of thing. So mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah. So how's everything, man? Cheers. 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 <laughs> Aqua to <With> whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> Rusted a rock and roll. <laughs> mm, very rock and roll style. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what's been happening with you? Have you um you've been you were in Jakarta recording an, a new album or what's um, uh, the I just recently released a new album, Satrio. And uh, that's released, was, awesome. Yeah, I was in Jakarta for about a month for a media visit and also visiting my mom since I haven't seen her for a few months. Yeah, you know, right. she's still there, but I'm planning maybe the next two or three years trying to move her out here in, in Bali. Out to Bali. Yeah. Oh, nice. Jakarta is just like I'm not cut out for a city anymore man, man <laughs> it's I don't so think, different I don't think city people are cut out for Jakarta yeah exactly <laughs> it's, like, it's intense and it's yeah. pretty how, how's your mum doing with the whole corona she's sort of situation good. she's up there? healthy you know oh, keeping, that's good. Yeah, yeah, keeping herself healthy mentally healthy spiritually healthy you know I contact her we communicate every day that's yeah. most important you know yeah that's good but yeah it's a very difficult time for musicians especially in Jakarta you know at least in Bali we still have like <clears> smaller gigs you know mm. not as paid as usual but yeah. at least you know there are things happening and we still you know there's still nature we can like check out and all of that i think that's the that's one of the like especially for me like personally one of the most important things here for me has been that nature side yeah, of things like yeah. you know the massive cut in gigs and finances and work and mm-hmm. all the stress of that to to go through that and not have the opportunity to go and dive into the ocean or sort of mm-hmm. feel like i'm on a tropical island where I can sort of get, I can feel like well I'm pretty lucky to be here mm-hmm, mm-hmm. even if I've got nothing else I can look up at the sky and my environment and yes, feel yes, pretty yes. pretty blessed yeah. as to where I am to be grateful for that you know yeah we're clo- closer to the to nature in Bali that's mm. right so uh, in in Jakarta is it is it really just a case of all the venues are shut and there's the a venues are shut and basically I remember because uh, oh, uh, right. yeah, I remember uh, well, Jakarta recently just had like a monorail. So I was trying that out in August. Me and my photographer and my manager were it's checking it's it out. It's the new monorail. The new like monorail, the right? And we were talking with a mask on and one of the securities in the train came up to us and was like, you can't like speak face to face. Are you serious? I'm serious. I'm like, what are you serious? <laughs> and we went to the mall and you like step in the elevator, you got to like face the wall with the security present there so wow. I just like it's, 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 it's like the stress and the tension you can just feel it all over the place you know it's everyone's so in masks and it's, all of that it's this really weird like m- misunderstanding almost of what true health is like yeah, yeah. in terms of there's no appreciation anymore based on all the rules and the authority that's sort of powering down mm-hmm. on everyone mm-hmm. There's no appreciation for health in terms of mental stability and, mm-hmm. and a feeling of an overall feeling of wellness in terms mm-hmm. of environment and mm-hmm. communication and, and just being around people and, and feeling good about that. Mm-hmm. It's like we're being, yeah, I mean, obviously Bali's a bubble, but every time I see examples of what's going on around the world in big cities, every time someone wants to relax or f- get some sunlight or like mm-hmm. you said, just talk face to face. Can't. <laughs> yeah. And, it, to the, and point the media of, news always feeds like, you know, mm. like the paranoia and so forth and so forth, you know? Mm. So yeah, it's, it's really tense. Do you feel like as a musician, you, you've kind of, it's a time where you feel really blessed to have a creative side to express yourself and to, to still be able to sit in your room by yourself and play your guitar and sing is such an incredible meditative feeling in a time like this where stress is such a overpowering sort yeah, of yeah. thing that's going on. I feel on. very blessed for that. I mm. mean, I'm usually that. I'm quite a reclusive, actually, quite introverted. Mm. That's why I chose to live in Bali. Uh, I moved here like five years ago. There's, uh, so Bali is pretty much my resting and nesting place. It's yeah, like right. my creative place where I can like 
shut out the whole world and I can just yeah. be by myself and then be myself also because it sure. seems like every time I step out uh, Bali I'm always seen as Ras Mohammed. Right, um, yeah. My real name is Egar. So right, right now, okay, yeah. who you're speaking to is Egar. You okay, know? good, good to know. <laughs> you know? So it's always like, you know, there's always like the image of Ras Mohammed and all of that. So mm. every time I'm, I'm in Bali, I'm just Egar, you know, sure. who creates to the vessel of Ras Mohammed, so to speak, you know. Do you, do you feel like there is a quite a thick line between Ras Mohammed and Egar in terms of uh, in terms of personality or, or the way you represent yourself? Is it is it quite different, quite vastly different? Mm, not different, but uh, I guess when people know me personally, I'm different from what I am on stage. On sure. stage, I'm more, you know, like commanding or something like that, more commanding mm. and more loud. You know, it seems like, oh, you know, he's a very probably extroverted person and this yeah. and that, but I'm definitely <laughs> not like that. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's quite a, a common thing, though, I find amongst artists. And, mm-hmm. I mean, sometimes it, it can go. It, sometimes it can go the other way. Some mm-hmm. people are quite extroverted, and mm-hmm. when they get on stage, they they freeze up a bit, yeah, but yeah. they still express beautiful, intimate music. Mm-hmm. But yeah, like I was, I remember reading a, I was listening to a podcast with um, uh, Smashing Pumpkins, Billy Corgan, okay, and uh, and just yeah, his whole conversation about that, how like over to, over the years he's you know so many fans have realized that behind the scenes he's just a dude that you know he loves Billy. sport he loves <laughs> yeah. sport and you know yeah, yeah, shit yeah. that you know the, that a gothic depressed yeah, yeah, yeah. angry <laughs> teenager isn't supposed to like mm. and he's like man he was explaining this in this one sort of moment where he was at at a fun park and he went down a um a full on roller coaster. Okay. Or some fun ride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like an and amusement park. Yeah, yeah, and there was a photo of him going down the ride and, and he just he said it just happened to be a moment where he had quite a serious face. And everyone <laughs> always has that, you know. Yeah, and it, and like everyone's posting like yeah. oh even on the fun ride he's still <laughs> angry gothic and it's like I'm really not <laughs> Oh it's funny huh mm-hmm. but yeah I mean that's I guess that's the beauty um that's what you want if you're if you're constantly travelling with yeah, a yeah, true, true. with an extroverted sort of stage presence. Mm-hmm. True, true. You need what was that your uh, first stage experience like? And how old were you? My very very first stage experience was I was in year eight, and year I played. Eight, so you'll be about sixteen, I think. Even no, no, younger, eight, like 13, fourteen yeah. or fifteen. Okay, okay. Probably fourteen. I had, and I played. Uh, where did you sleep last night? Unplug the, uh, the, the, uh, the Nirvana, song, yeah, Nirvana unplugged okay. um, nice. version, mm. and uh, yeah, it was just it was with a mate of mine, a really good friend of mine. We sort of started singing together. We used to sneak out of our bedroom windows at mm. night at like two in the morning and mm. meet at this under this railway tunnel at night and yeah, sing yeah, together. Yeah, yeah. And then we learnt that song and we cool. got up at a at a school thing, and I was just like sweating and bullets and he just had his face hidden behind his hand was, you know. what about you what was the first me I think I was about 14 or 15 it was like a hole in the wall bar uh, so it was in well, a bar I was at a bar mate you stepped it up you're already in a bar I was at a bar I'm, I'm at a fucking school library <laughs> well uh, I was blessed to grow up uh, partially in my lifetime in New York City yeah so I was during that great. time yeah so I mean my background in music is not just reggae music. It's uh, also Indonesian traditional music, Indonesian pop music. That's the music that my mom and dad listened to. Uh, my very first albums that I bought were cassette tapes, and that was Metallica's Black Album and also Nirvana's Nevermind. Yeah, right. Yeah, nice. and we just, you know, mentioned yeah. Nirvana. Yeah. But uh, that was actually... We, uh, me and my cousins, we chipped in buying Nirvana's Nevermind because we were just like curious about the album itself because there's a naked baby. It's like, what's going on here? Oh, and right. It was just drawn like, for yeah. that reason. Yeah. <laughs> it smells like ten, Teen Spirit just hit us. It's like, wow, you know. And yeah. yeah, it started from there. But when I got to New York. Uh, what, what took you to New York? Uh, my mom, she just recently retired, but she, her career was a diplomat. So she was posted there. Oh, wow. I think it was her second post. How long were you there? Uh, she was posted there for about four years, but I was oh. there uh, quite some time. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> about 12 years. <laughs> so once, once she moved on, she you moved were on, yeah, I stayed old there. enough to stay. Yeah, I stayed there. So, but uh, uh, when I got to New York, uh, Wu-Tang just blew up. Just blew up. 
like they uh-huh. just released 36 chambers and yeah. me coming from asia and like uh, my dad taking me to watch kung fu movies i was like what's this right. it's like, it, like really connected to me i mean i was familiar with like public enemy in indonesia but like wu-tang just blew me away it's like oh you know so that was the would you say that was the first music that just grabbed you Grabbed you by the balls, like this yeah, is yeah. the one, yeah. yeah. Wu Tang, Wu Tang, and then afterwards uh, was dance hall music, dance hall reggae music. Right. Uh, my cousin who lived in New York at that time, he was listening to dance hall, and I was like, "What is this? It sounds like rap, but I couldn't understand the language." It's like, "What is this?" And it's like, "Oh, it's reggae." So that was my first exposure. Oh. So, uh, yeah. So uh, on the other hand, I was listening to hip hop and dance hall reggae, but I also was. Uh, alternative or metal kid mm. I listened to a lot of Metallica Slayer Anthrax Megadeth Nine Inch Nails nice. and all of that so nice. so that pretty much uh, I found a set of friends and they love music and we got some got, got a band together right. and I think our first gig was like around 1996 or 1997 we had a friend another friend of ours who was in a band and we were like hey we want to find a gig you know, you've been playing gigs, so can you hook us up? He's like, yeah, you know, uh, call this number. He's going to pick up. He's probably going to give you like a, some audition night, you know. At that time, there were no MySpace, no emails or anything like that. Mm-hmm. So you had to like really like explain how the band sound through verbally, you know. So yeah. like, all right, uh, we're going to give you, you know, this audition night. Little did he know that he just booked up underage band <laughs> oh, right. nice. yeah and they're like you know so, 21 the age of yeah, the yeah. So. so all of us had like exes you know even like yeah. one of my boys who's you know living in Bali now and I know him since what since we were 12 or 13 you know he came to my first gig and he was like 13 at that time yeah, well. the bouncer was like what the oh, he has a baby face even now, so you can you can imagine how <laughs> he young looks he like was. Yeah. Like he should be wearing a nappy, just <laughs> <It's> rocking up. <laughs> like, how old are you? <laughs> like I'm 13. It's like, man, you're gonna get me fired and right, get your exes and all of that. But then afterwards, yeah, alhamdulillah, we we're grateful because uh, we had about like 50, 60 people of our friends came along, and in which they were of legal age, so right, they could like okay. buy drinks and like that. So they booked us for another one, another one, and we hooked up with different bands and all of that. But the music that I did. Uh, that we did was a mix of what was it like 311 Rage Against the Machine and an element of hardcore music of New York hardcore music nice mix. so what, we were what would you what would you say defines a New York sounding hardcore music was there was there a particular edge to it to, to New York music at that time New that York hardcore is pretty much New York hardcore scene so it's like uh, well in the 80s it would be like Minor Threat okay uh, but then uh, it would be like uh, 25 to Life or like a biohazard sounding oh, yeah. type of a sound. So we were in that scene. They embraced us because we had a harder edge than your regular hard so it's quite, rock. So you were quite heavy. Very heavy. So oh, right. I grew up in mosh pits and all of that. And it was nice. like, and, and the type of mosh pits, it wasn't just like slam dancing, pushing around. It was actually like Broken throwing legs. <laughs> punches and knees and elbows. Yeah. Like, what's going on? It's like warfare. It's like that. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> Go, totally different. It's like almost like polar opposites of like what I'm doing now. Yeah. You know? But I still appreciate it. But there's a beauty in that. There's. It's funny, like a lot of people assume that if someone is that a, a leader in their field as you are like you oh, thank you there's a well yeah i mean you, you you're so respected for the field you you're in and there's often a an assumption that if that's the case that's all you're into but it's quite amazing how you know most musicians who are who are great at what they do have such a broad range of music that they mm-hmm. love and appreciate and it usually comes from so much experimenting with other styles before they find their groove mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um yeah do you Whereabouts in, in New York were you living? Were you? Uh, I was living in Queens. All oh, right. Yeah, it was Regal Park, Forest Hills, and then I moved to Astoria, and then moved to Jackson Heights, all over the place. I so when, place. how are we? Like, when did you leave New York? I think I was like there for twelve in, years, uh, like huh? early twenties, mid twenties. Right. Yeah, but then afterwards, I really focused on reggae music because I was uh, in college. It was a community college actually, and there were a lot of uh, Caribbeans. And they, you know, took me under their wings and took me to sound systems in which I, that was my first, really first hand exposure and experience of like the reggae culture of like mm. sound systems and all of that. And they were the ones that pushed me. It's like, oh, you have talent, you know? So it's like, you know, make demos and all of that. So I actually made a demo before I left New York in which I was like passing it around. Like, yeah, and that was city. more within the style that you're doing now? Yes, yes. So yes. what was that? 
like what was that transition for you to go from sort of the heavy the heavy band where you're mm-hmm. building up a really you're getting respect within mm-hmm. that field because if you're getting respect within a certain field it's very easy to stick with that field yeah, right yeah, yeah, yeah. so what was that transition that went that pulled you into the, the what you're doing now well uh i remember with the band that i started with we had a at the end before we broke up it was do two creative decisions okay i wanted more of a hip-hop film and the drummer wanted more of a psychedelic and the guitarist wanted more of like thrash metal and we just couldn't find <laughs> it's it. Just yeah, just, <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah. that could either really work or really yeah, fucking really not work. Like failed <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it was that i mean we're still friends but we just like went di- on different directions so then i had like a few hip-hop projects but then i realized like i'm not really an mc i still love singing mm-hmm. but i'm not really a singer so that's how i found it in reggae you know where my vocals are more percussive but uh. I still can have melodies because uh, besides playing guitar, I can also play drums. So every time I sing, I imagine a drum in my head. Is always that. That's why my lyrics are more dense. Oh, like nice. that. So I imagine. Is there a particular percussive? Have you been trained percussively, or have you have you, are you self-taught, or yeah, like, self-taught, self-taught? And is that percussion the kind of percussion you're drawing on? Is it? Is it? Does it come from an Indonesian background, or, or is there a particular? part of the world that that percussion comes from or it's just it just comes out natural yeah. it just comes yeah. out natural I don't yeah, know cool. yeah. it's the yeah, yeah it's your soul's percussion yeah, it's the it's sound awesome. of your soul banging away yeah. <laughs> that's always good <laughs> yeah wow so I guess was there any sort of backlash what like what, so the, it was the band that break like it was actually the band breaking up that yeah, pushed yeah. you to go into a new style yeah, yeah, and so yeah. it was once the band broke up then you're on your own and mm-hmm, you're like, okay, mm-hmm. what do I want to create mm-hmm, as mm-hmm. a solo just by myself? Mm-hmm. Okay. And that's yeah. where the, the demos started. The demo started. First, is, uh, first was hip hop and then it evolved into reggae music, you know. And from there it was, you, you built that up in the States before you ended up back in Indonesia? Yeah, I built that up in the States. And then I came back like here, 2005 and I saw how the reggae scene was. And I was like, whoa, okay, it's different. <laughs> it was very, it was just say monotonous you know everyone just had the same style maybe more like 90s pop reggae or maybe just like the classic bob marley sounding mm. type of reggae definitely you know? the um i mean it's so almost the classic thing isn't it that like an island sort of any kind of island place and mm-hmm. immediately goes for that you know all the bars are playing the classic yeah, sounding, yeah, the classic sounding ones. was there a was there a sort of a deeper underground scene here with reggae that you found or, or you, no, f- you felt that it just wasn't happening it just yeah, wasn't well. happening yeah well yeah so then I released my first album national album Reggae Ambassador that itself the title itself was very controversial yeah I mean that just <laughs> I mean it kind of says it all doesn't it it's like mate if you haven't if you haven't got it I'll just have like, to yeah, bring it it's like oh, who's this new kid calling himself Reggae Ambassador he's like does he represent us and this and that so it was more like you know I'm even though I'm introverted and quiet, I like shaking a few cages, you know, a yeah, few yeah, cages. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so it was that. And uh, the album itself consists more of dancehall elements. So mm. more of like, you know, digitalized rhythms and all of that, you know, wanting to expose more that reggae is not just Bob Marley. There are some different styles like dub dance hall and all of that so it it's was so very new and fresh no one was doing it so i was like all right you know that's great i mean and how many years ago was that now that's about 13 years ago and did you notice i mean i'm, I'm sure that if you were the first one that was really pushing that you must have noticed because very quickly you know there's, it, as soon as someone does something new there's always a vacuum behind them mm-hmm. that people start to fill you know mm-hmm. like it's like they it's like when you jump behind the, the ambulance in the traffic to try and get ahead because yeah, yeah, you're yeah. like, oh, it's slipstream. <laughs> well, that always happens with bands, you know. There's a, there's a band doing something or a, a musician doing something different and then immediately people jump in and they go, oh, wow. Um, did you notice that a lot more people started pulling in and sort of a, a scene developed around the style you were creating? Uh, taking elements of what I've uh, introduced, mm-hmm. yes. But until to this moment, I still haven't found any one that's like can do dance hall as I did yeah well that's yeah, great so I mean, it's, that's, it's, 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 it's funny yeah well, it, <laughs> makes, it makes you it makes you uniquely unique yeah you know? it's, that's, that's awesome but uh, have you felt 
that the scene itself here has broadened since yes you definitely <clears throat> comparing to 13 years ago definitely there are more uh more of my brothers that are experimenting with dub music taking elements of dance hall and all of that so yeah nice yeah where where are you like where do you predominantly play around indonesia where the where the strongest crowds are that appreciate it oh, well alhamdulillah all over the place but uh definitely papua um, Flores, mostly eastern provinces. Really well. Yeah, Flores, I think I had like about 50,000 people. <laughs> Man. I was like, oh, that's crazy. That's great. <laughs> we usually play our national anthem, and it was like, at the first second we play it back on the national anthem, I just goosebumps because everyone was singing oh. and just like high energy from beginning until the end. Beautiful. You know, so, yeah. What a moment. Why do you think it is that the, the eastern islands are more, are more into that style? Hmm. <laughs> Is there any sort of background as to, did, like, did somebody go through there? Or do, do you think it could simply come down to, like, that old school thing where a certain demo tapes just happen to end up in the hands of those people and, they, and it spread, you know? Yeah. Isn't it funny how that happened? Like, we've missed, like, that age is gone now. It's a, mm. That's what I really miss about the pre-digital days is, is when a demo, literally one cassette tape in one school kid's hand mm. going into one classroom... <laughs> And it just spawns this whole cult following to a mm. band or, or a genre mm-hmm. because everyone starts copying it. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, like, it's almost like following how the fuck a virus started. Like, mm-hmm. you know, if you're trying to, like, science is trying to work out where coronavirus started, mm. who gave it to who and which wet market yeah, did yeah, it start yeah. up or which Fauci developed it <laughs> <laughs> in some dodgy laboratory. You can do that with early, mm. with like, you know, pre-late 90s music. You mm. can trace the the cult following back to where the, the digital TDK cassette <laughs> TDK. Went, into, <laughs> went into a double cassette player and someone pressed dubbing speed record <laughs> passed it on to their friends. I remember I had that. My mom, my mom bought me some like karaoke with like double decks in which I can record. So first time, I think one of my demos that I did when I was like 12 or 13, like I recorded my own drums and then oh, afterwards... Cool. I put get electric guitars in it, <laughs> and then I, I tone the guitar into like a bass somewhat. Oh, right. How did you do that? <laughs> I, I just put more bass in it, oh, so right. yeah, yeah, yeah. and then like, and then afterwards I rapped over it. It's like, yeah. oh, it's pretty nice. It's like, oh, I made my own song Inventive. and just like double decks and like that. Yeah. Oh man, <laughs> I love that shit. I love the the inventive nature that mm-hmm. we had to have, sort of back then. Like, yeah, it's incredible. I still remember. Actually, just recently I posted a. Uh, myself doing an acoustic song and it was the first acoustic song I didn't write the music but it was the first song I ever wrote as, an, as a song when Ooh. I was 14 or 15 um, I wrote used to write lyrics and all this kind of stuff but I had a best friend at the time who played guitar and he, he sent me and I still remember this moment he sent me a TDK cassette where he recorded this guitar riff and it was beautiful he's an amazing guitarist yeah, and I still remember sitting in my room, rewinding it and playing it, rewinding it and playing it, writing the lyrics, writing the vocal pattern. And then, yeah, same thing. I had one of those tape decks that had like a, just a little external, in, internal mic. Mm-hmm. And you just press, you just flick a switch, press record, and you can sing over the top. Yeah, and yeah, record, yeah, 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 record yeah. onto it. It was similar like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, recording it and sending it back to him. Mm. And yeah, I rehashed it recently and got all that, that whole flood of memories. Uh, of just nice. how it felt back then to be like so insular. Yeah. Resourceful, resourcefulness of yeah <laughs> yeah and there's a real I think there's some there's something that we lose with songwriting when when we're so aware that what you're doing is immediately going to be put out to so many people digitally like yeah true yeah like the I look back at my my songwriting when I was younger and I didn't have any as I was sitting in that room with the guitar mm-hmm. writing and pressing record there was no expectation of like, oh, in one hour I can post this digitally and like so many people can see it, all mm. the people on my Facebook feed or my Instagram. None of that was there. So there wasn't like an expectation of how good it had to be. There was no, no expectation of, of how, how I should shape it for them. Mm-hmm. It was purely yeah. me in the moment. The purity of it. Yeah. yeah. Do, you find, do you find in your songwriting that you – have you ever had trouble with that – line of like making sure that what you're doing is is purely for yourself or do you get do you ever get daunted by the fact that now that you have so many people waiting for your music Mm -hmm. and expecting it does that sometimes inhibit your songwriting process yeah i actually went to like uh 
like an exhaustion, a creative exhaustion. Because uh, <clears throat> when I put myself as this role as reggae ambassador, I felt like there's this uh, realization and also awareness that I have to like educate uh, my audience. Mm. So I was first and foremost educating through music. You right. know, so I first had to I like, oh, you know, they need to get where this music is coming from, need to be connected to Kingston, Jamaica and everything and everything like that until I exhausted myself from touring. And also I was working in radio for about five years right. and ended up like, uh, I remember being on stage. I was like on autopilot. I'm like, what am I doing here? I get on stage, you know, like and in the back of your brain, yeah, yeah, you're watching yourself just, just like, go through what the is motions? this becoming very self-conscious? It's like, mm. what am I doing again? I just lost maybe the fire of it, you know? And then, uh, with this new album that I release, it's my most very personal and intimate project. Oh, the one so, just now. Yeah, Satria. Oh, wow. So it's, when you listen to the album, it's pretty much my journey of my past five to six years with like going to Kingston, Jamaica and I met Toke. Toke is pretty much my soulmate, he's my brethren, you know. He yeah. sparked something in me. I saw something uh, that was pure, that's still pure. And I saw like a younger version of me, mm. you know, I just, oh, you know, so he lit that fire again I was just, wow, it's amazing. I said, it was an amazing feeling. And even though he was experimenting with reggae music at that time there was also his element in which he was still young but he still has that element of just like being him and his own voice he was very vulnerable and personal in his songs and his stories and in his narratives i'm like wow this is something very very different you so know? that in him inspired that in you yeah again. inspired yeah. that you know so yeah it's so important, isn't it it's i mean you really do go through waves i guess and, and mm -hmm. especially if you feel like if you start to feel like what you're doing has a level of responsibility with it, it's really easy to get that. Yeah, it's, it's and I guess it happens to a lot of artists. Like I, I've, I read a lot of interviews with big artists who, you know, their first album was the collection of things they'd written while they were in the bedroom, not thinking about fame and not thinking mm -hmm. about that true, true. audience. And then the second album is the hardest because all of a sudden, yeah. The, the pressure. Yeah, the pressure is to back <laughs> it up. The music critiques and yeah, all of that, the yeah. fans and all of that. <laughs> and also you don't have, you know, um, you might not, for the second album, you might not be drawing on 15 years of growth and all the things that came with it all of a sudden you've you're expected to do it all again within six months mm -hmm. and to create the same energy and the same vibe mm -hmm. and I, I guess it's always a battle yeah but it's interesting too that it's it's often over the longer distance that people get back to theirs themselves like yeah. which sounds like it's exactly what's happened to you mm -hmm. you know you've been through a long process and yeah. you felt that responsibility you felt like you were out of it and exhausted and now you're finding that yeah I felt like I was just disconnected from myself mm. you know with this uh, new album Satrio it took me three and a half years to complete wow. so it's pretty much a passion project I mean I'm an independent artist so it's pretty much like 15 years been uh, working independently just like you know distributing with my own music but with this album and the album before that Salam I uh, work with a uh, Oneness Records, they're based in Munich, but they're most, mostly on just on the producing side. So with this one, they were pretty much very patient with me in the whole ride and the whole journey. So it was pretty much a passion project. They didn't mm. tell me like, oh, you don't have any hits yet. You know, this yeah, album's right. taking too long. We give you another six months and you gotta finish it. If you ain't finished and then <laughs> we're not gonna put it out. But then they're extremely patient. What, what, why is your relationship with them so good? Have you got a long his history together now or were they just aware of your position they knew they couldn't rush you no matter yeah, what. Yeah, they were just aware and how we started because uh, the Salam album was uh, very successful. Uh, so they were like offering me another one, uh, the second project, and mm. this with Satrio album. But uh, I told them that I want to approach it on a different aspect. I want to approach it in a different direction as me more taking up the role of songwriting, writing things from scratch, from zero, my ideas, you know, and mm. also co-producing and all of that. And it won't just be reggae. You know, I have my, because I really want to show my Egara side, the geek side, the loving the movies and all of that. So I have yeah. like, you know, songs that were inspired by like, you know, Kill Bill, Nancy Sinatra is like a Bang Bang song and oh, all no. of that. I the love rock it. Music. That's one of my favorite yeah. covers to play is Bang <laughs> you know? Bang. I love that track. Yeah. So, do you do a cover of that? Yeah, yeah, I do. Oh, nice. I do that. I, com I combine that into my live performance also. Oh, so, cool, yeah, man. Yeah. Fuck, I'd love to hear that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's one of the covers that I do 
that gets the most response. Okay, okay it's just okay, a okay. great cover. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, I do yeah, more. Yeah. I do more. Like I go very like drag it out, but then when it gets the bang bang, I I do loops. Mm-hmm, I mm-hmm. often play with you know Reza Rhythm Shepherd. Yeah, 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 yeah. Rhythm Shepherd. Um, we played together in Japan for nice. a few months, and that that track like he he just jump in and crank nice. it up and yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a fun chorus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and also the Satria album was pretty much uh, inspired as an answer to an album that I revisit every year, at least, you know, once mm. a year. That would be Nine Inch Nails' Downward Spiral. Oh, wow, yeah, man, yeah. I've just been listening to that again. Oh, lately. really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no joke. Like, just recently, I've been hanging out with a few people that just, I guess they're younger than me, so I, uh, just, just a few times lately, just coincidentally, I've hung out with someone, you know, probably 10 years younger than me mm-hmm. where they haven't been, they haven't grown up with the same music as me. Mm-hmm. And I've been like, just going through songs in my head, like, okay, surely you know this. And, and one of the songs that I keep bringing up is Closer. It's just closer. because it's, wow, because I'm yeah. always fascinated by how someone reacts to that if they didn't grow up with it and they haven't heard it before. Mm-hmm. But one for just, it's, just how fucking cool it is the way it's written but two just it's shock factor like how someone's going to react when they hear those lines you know the hook. yeah because nah, 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 yeah. I mean it's just got <laughs> such but you know what cracks me up about that is even back when it first came out you know it it could be taken you know everything these days can be triggering someone it can yeah, be yeah. taken the wrong way mm-hmm. or whatever man back in back when that first came out you would have no one on the dance floor. The DJ would hit that track. Yeah. Every girl in that yeah. venue would be Such on that dance song. floor Such just song. loving it, yeah, just yeah. drowning in it. Just <laughs> Something about it's mm. so sexy, man. I know, definitely. Yeah. But what's so incredible about that album in general, it, yes, it tells a story. It has a narrative. But during that time, it was what, produced 1993, 1994? Mm. I'm still amazed on how Trent Reznor can build that such a vast soundscape. It's incredible. You know, right. like Mr. Soft, the shock, and there would, there's that loop of like the guitar. We're like, what is going on here? How does he, and it is like little crackles and it's just static. And it's oh. like, how does he do this? It's like, and it's, like, you know, I mean, he, he combines like organic, you know, instruments with like, loops and everything but it still sounds organic like the the, the 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 not digitalized sounds but like the yeah. samples and the keyboards it's and it so sounds so organic song. i'm like how does he do this you know it just sounds like and it was really you know stepping out of the usual and just yeah one of those minds that like he obviously saw a picture in his head and it was so different to anything anyone was doing at the time and he was just Definitely. like i need to make that happen and he found ways of making it happen even when when it was when that album first came out, I wasn't a huge fan of it. I really I was blown away by it. But even for me, I was I was so caught up in grunge at that time mm-hmm. that it was even a little bit too industrial for me. Like just taste wise, mm-hmm. I was like, "What the fuck's going on here?" Like, <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I loved the song Closer, but the album as a whole, I didn't listen to it a lot because I was really caught up in grunge at the time. But I listen to it now and I just go, man, like the shit he was doing at that know, time was just... It's crazy yeah. how he achieved that soundscape. It's just like, wow, it's like yeah, <laughs> mind-blowing even to this day. I love even seeing him now, just the stuff he's creating. Now, he, I listened to something recently. It was the soundtrack or something. Oh, what was it? Damn it, I'm, I'm blanking on it. But it was a, it was a cover of a track that is... It, an instrumental cover of a, tr- of a song and it was just so different from the original just this dark beautiful journey it was for a okay. for a TV show I think a TV show okay no, yeah ah no, no. oh, man oh anyway <laughs> I'm sure as soon as the podcast ends I'll go oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 2 o'clock tonight I'll wake up and go Ross <laughs> yeah yeah man there's just there's so many of those guys that were just doing incredible things back then. Like even, even bands like the Prod- Prodigy and... Um, yeah, definitely. Massive Attack even mm-hmm. and Portishead. You know? Portishead, oh, I mean, Portishead, Portishead, yeah. Yeah, Portishead were... were th- that whole looping, bringing in the DJ mm-hmm. element, like the that electronic element that was just so beautifully done mm-hmm. So na- and such a natural balance with the mm-hmm. organic sound. Mm-hmm. I mean, she, you know, 
I can't imagine a, a, a jazz enthusiast not enjoying listening to Portishead, even though it had such an electronic element to mm-hmm. it. Because mm-hmm. you'd just be, you'd be like, I can't deny that voice. Yeah. I can't deny that passion. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was so in love with her, man. Mm. I must have. Beth Gibbons. I, I must have had sex to that album more times than <laughs> <laughs> Which one? The first one or the second one? The first one. The first one. <laughs> yeah, Dummy is just like, that yeah. was my go-to. <laughs> if you haven't had sex <laughs> to Glory Box, you have not yeah, had sex. <laughs> true, true. So how's the reaction been so far for the for Satrio? For Satrio, it's been slow for this year, you know, because I'm usually more of like, you know, hands-on type of guy so uh, usually when i release an album um go on tour probably like press up a few promotional cds and then send them out you know so it's been slow okay. but i've been patient with it so it's like producing the album have to be patient and also promoting the album got to be patient also yeah, for this sure. time, different if it's times. all on your shoulders but, yeah but you know what another thing is that if it uh, i imagine that if it's a, if it's an album that you created so introspectively and so personal to you mm-hmm. and if you kind of took a little bit more of a, a different direction and wrote something that just came from the heart and wasn't produced with the crowd in mind it was mm-hmm. just for yourself I just imagine that it's an album that will take a little bit longer mm-hmm. to to grow on people true. because that's what growing is right true, true, true. and I can imagine it's something true. that'll stick harder true because it's always like that, right? Yeah, like yeah. it's always the, you know, some of my favourite albums and favourite artists, I didn't really get the first time I listened to it mm-hmm. or I might have been confused by it or I might have thought, I don't know about this mm-hmm. one. And then, you know, three listens later and you're like, what the Okay, fuck? I get it, I get it. And yeah. you're literally shaking your friends going, yeah, no, no, yeah. listen to it again, yeah. dude. You've got to listen to it again. <laughs> like all of that, you know, like, you know, Tool, man, Tool, Anima, I... Oh no, that got me straight away. Yeah, actually. they got me straight away. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> no, I still remember. Where were you? What was the first time you listened to that? Do you remember the first time you listened to Anima? Uh, Anima was probably probably MTV. They oh, right. played Stinkfist. Oh bam, right, okay. Bam, 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 yeah. I think I, I probably I must have heard that, but and already appreciated it. But I remember I was sitting. I was in Brisbane. I was like twenty, sitting out in the balcony of my house. And a dude was there and he, he was raving about it too. He fucking loved Tool. And he's like, have you ever really listened to Tool? And I'm like, oh, I don't think I've really listened to them. And he goes, sit right fucking there. And he <laughs> goes off and he just rolled up this massive fat one. Uh-huh. And then he, he disappeared for like 10 minutes and he uh-huh. goes, come here. <laughs> and I walk in her, into this room and he's pulled the whole stereo system down mm. off the walls and he's pulled a mattress off a bed mm. and he's put the speakers either side of the mattress mm. and set the pillows up between the speakers and he's just lit this massive doobie. <laughs> he's laying me down. He said, smoke the fuck out of that and shut up. Yeah. <laughs> and he just, and he cranked uh, Eulogy. Yeah, uh, well, I was about to yeah. ask what's your favourite track the song. and my favourite track is Eulogy. Yeah, man. Oh, my <laughs> that God. drum right like at the middle of the song. Oh. <laughs> Mm. It's just mm. Mm. I'm like what uh, <laughs> from it, all that you know <laughs> all that heaviness and then just a drum and Maynard's voice. I'm like, okay, this is crazy. <laughs> that moment, oh, I can't even. Yeah, mate, I'm with you. It also really spoke to me because I grew up uh, heavily Christian mm-hmm. and really like sort of indoctrinated with that mm-hmm. whole idea of of Christianity and Jesus and. And that song is so, I mean, I guess everyone can take it to mean a different thing, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but I, I immediately took it as a reflection of Jesus, mm-hmm. as a reflection of someone who thinks they're a saviour here to save everyone, but, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and this, this struggle of like, well, who are you really to, like, mm-hmm. to, to convince us that you're right mm-hmm. and, um, you know, get off your cross, you know. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I had so much that related to that song as I was, and obviously I'm mean, just deep in the fucking stoned hole, <laughs> just disappearing into Mado's voice. Mm. Oh man, what a what a track, what an what album. What a track, and how it builds with it. Ah, oh. and yeah, have those little sitars, bang, bang, yeah. bang, bang, and it just, woo. <laughs> it just just seems, seems to be such a. Um, that's the thing I really miss now is. And, and again, I go back to the whole digital age and people writing. 
in the moment that they're writing, they're thinking about the, the greater audience and they're mm-hmm. thinking about what they have to do to connect with them instead mm-hmm. of just writing something that, for themselves. Yeah, sure. And it's that, that we're losing that songwriting where someone takes themselves on a journey. Because if they take themselves on a journey, you'll, you'll end up on the journey. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But if they're writing something to try and please a greater audience, to, to get them hooked as fast as possible, it's often not a great journey. Yeah, true. Yeah, and that, you know, that song, Eulogy, is, it's like they don't give a fuck what people think. Mm. They are just, we're on a journey. Yeah. And, like, you're going to listen to that, 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 that for as long as we want you to, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Are there any other sort of major influences that you've had that you would say, and, and I'm talking not reggae, like like mm-hmm. other people that sort of pre-reggae have have still, you know, tools of such a, so different to what you do now. Mm-hmm. But are there any, any other sort of bands that you, maybe people would un, not expect you to be influenced by? Uh, right now, I am revisiting Deftones. Oh, right. Deftones. Yeah, nice. yeah, yeah, they're very... Their music is powerful, very emotional. And also, I love how they set up their own formula for music, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, there's like elements of metal, but then Chino sings very, he has a very feminine type of voice, but it's so strong. Mm. That's like, yeah, I take elements of that too. And there's like some formulas that they do where they do, all right, when the chorus comes, it's only half of chorus. And when the chorus comes back again, they would do the full chorus, you know, all mm. of that, and all of those things like I would incorporate that into my music and all of that yeah i've never uh, that's the first time i've thought about his singing as feminine but it's you're very right feminine very you're feminine. right i never i never put that to it very feminine I've while the music is heavy but he's like very feminine how he sings it you're so, right yeah that's a really good description yeah like yeah. a th- like a throat whispering and like you know yeah. <laughs> when did you how first hear you change like you know yeah it's so true oh, yeah. actually he even <laughs> kind of screams the way a a, a female might go into a screen. Yeah, it's not yeah. just an angry man. It's yeah, yeah. just a soft... Ah, <laughs> just that, yeah. slips Such an amazing it. singer, man. <laughs> yeah, it's phenomenal. Mm. I had a really mind-blowing experience <clears throat> the first time I realised how much I love Deftones. I used to um, work stages in Australia and, and do a lot of stage management and sound. and all, Not sound, but setting up stages for music festivals and the Deftones was a band that I always knew their name but I obviously had it, the wrong impression in my head of who they were. <clears throat> I, for some reason I thought they were a punk or ska band mm-hmm. and so I'd never even given them the time of day. <laughs> you probably get it mixed up with the Mighty Mighty Bass Tones. <laughs> yeah, could, yeah, probably. <laughs> probably. You know me at that age. And uh, yeah, and I just wasn't really into ska or punk at that time. So yeah, and then I they were headlining this I was doing this festival in um in Sydney and they were they were headlining and they were the last yeah because they were headlining they were the last band so I didn't have to set up another band after them normally and it was a double stage so normally like while one band's playing you're setting up the next band but for them it was the last band and it was like okay I'm just going to watch them and I got to because I'm in my all blacks they were all set up and I just went and sat in front of the speaker stack on the stage, there was like a lip of the stage, mm. like under the speaker where I could just sort of huddle down. Mm. And I was, my ear was up against the bass speaker so I could handle it because it wasn't a high frequency that would bust my ears. So I was just like huddled in there. And I'm looking out to my left at this, this sea of thousands of people. And, you know, there's dudes looking at me going, motherfucker, what are you doing there? You know, like, <laughs> you know and people like, what are you doing up there? And I'm like, I'm just going to sit here and enjoy this. And, I, and, like, I could see across to the whole stage. Chino's there, side view of him just, like, mm. getting ready to go. And I was sort of thinking, I'll just watch it because, you know, I love watching live music. They kicked off and I just went, oh, my God, this is religious. <laughs> I'm, just ha- I'm having a moment. Like, I was sold, yeah. I just couldn't mm-hmm. believe the style and the sound, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I hadn't, hadn't realised how good they were. Yeah, what a band, man. Incredible. Yeah, I think when uh, bands come out and they define their own sound, and it's just that, like, Deftones are just Deftones. The, people call them alternative metal and this and that. For me, it's just it's Deftones. Yeah. Same way as, like, Nine Inch Nails is Nine Inch Nails. Yeah, people it's true. try to box them in, like, oh, industrial rock. No, Nine Inch Nails is Nine Inch Nails. Yeah. Deftones are Deftones. You have you to know? tell someone to listen to that band to understand yeah, what yeah. you're talking about. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, is there any um, with with your music? Is there a like we've talked a lot about music itself, but is there an ideal or a or a um, any kind of spiritual sort of projection that you put through your music? That you, like a place, that, <coughs> something that you believe intensely. Are you religious at all, or do you have a particular set of beliefs that you you like to put through your music? Uh, I believe music is a very spiritual form and a very spiritual form of expression. That's how I see it, you know. But uh, I myself, I don't know, maybe people would think I'm religious, but I don't think I'm religious. I'm devoted to faith. I believe in God deeply, and that uh, flows through that. Sure. Mm -hmm. So you're, you don't specifically talk about a religious ideal within your music but your with satrio yes it's very did? much faith uh faith based it's very okay. much uh in islam right yeah. uh with this journey like uh, a lot of the verses from the quran and also the oh, wow, poets okay. uh, the, uh, the poems of uh, rumi like helped me to heal and also to give me courage also to further this journey okay mm -hmm. so there's a so you found solace in this time, in mm -hmm. this sort of introspective time, you found mm -hmm. a solace within that belief system. Yes, and and they they are they kind of like mantras. Would you say those those verses and those things that you reflect on within yeah, the Quran? Mantras and also affirmations. Mm -hmm. You know, because there are moments in my life where I just like was very deeply in self doubt. Like, am I doing this right? Like, what am I doing with my life and all of that? You know. So yeah, where I felt like I failed and all of that. Yeah. yeah right. Mm. Is it is the overall feel of the album for you when you listen back to it? Mm -hmm. Is it one of hope? Is it one of <clears throat> is it one of sort of? Do you feel the whole journey of despair and then climbing out of it, or do you feel like the whole the whole album is is more a feeling of hope, or what? What's the general feeling in it? Of growth, actually. Mm. So the album starts as a man broken or maybe hurt by this physical world, and he chooses to climb up instead of falling down so by the end of the album the listener also can feel that oh this man has grown and he's he's at this level of consciousness let's so to say you know excellent and uh, did you start did you uh did you order the album with that in mind? Did you? No, not at all. Really? Wow. <laughs> not at all. Almost, almost maybe like the final phases of it. Like, like oh, this tell this actually tells a journey. It's like, oh, I can piece them together. Oh, uh, cool. You know, so I just like it just seeps in. <laughs> Man, that's even that's even better. Like that's uh, that's the beauty of writing, right? When you yeah. when you're just doing it for yourself, it, things just seem to fall into place mm -hmm, without mm -hmm. a particular planned agenda. Mm -hmm. um, so something I've been thinking a lot about lately is is this I. I keep going back to it, but like that whole idea of doing things not for other people, not for, not for the end result, but for the the feeling within the moment, mm -hmm. the, the feeling of gratification and happiness, joy and passion that you mm -hmm. feel within mm -hmm. the moment of doing something. Mm -hmm. I think this year has been a big lesson for me in like going back to that, mm -hmm. and I really notice when other artists you can really tell when someone's written from that place because there's something disjointed about the sound of something when someone has manufactured it for, mm, the, for the idea <clears throat> of what people want. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so you must feel kind of like you've given birth, I guess. Like yeah, it's a, <laughs> given birth and a rebirth. <laughs> yeah, like it really is a process of sort of giving birth to all your, mm -hmm. your own personal mm -hmm. feelings and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, pretty much uh, for this year, I also have that uh, come to an awareness that we should be grateful of emotions, not mm -hmm. just happiness, you know, of sorrow and all of that, turning pain into wisdom, you know, being a creative like you and I, you know, we should be grateful that those emotions are there because that's make us human. You yeah. Know, emotions. It's so true. Like there's so, it's so often we fight. And I think that's a real strange thing again about the climate today of people fighting. See, people seem to be fighting against anything that triggers them in a negative way. Mm -hmm. And there's this um, disregard for the positive effects that can come from a negative experience. Mm -hmm. People are so determined to avoid negative experiences mm -hmm. that they they get angry at people mm -hmm. if they 
if they make them feel bad or yeah, if yeah. they if they make uh, cause them to have to question themselves and then mm. they they're like you triggered me and I shouldn't have to feel that way mm. but it, actually if no if you were never triggered if you never went through heartache or pain or sorrow mm. or rejection or hurt or or had to question why you reacted that mm. way you wouldn't really be able to solidify your own self like mm-hmm. it's such a True. it's such a passage of growth True. to go through those True. things one of my inspiring uh, poems from rumi would be the wound is where the light enters you the wound is where the, the light, light enters, enters you. that's a great yeah, line that really inspired me it's like okay so i really have to learn of life's experiences and grow from it you know it's so yeah. true man it's beautiful the wound is where the light enters you that's beautiful man thank you so much for coming I think, I think we should end on that note yeah. the wound is where the light enters you I think everyone should just walk away from this podcast right. with that ringing in their ears but uh, man beautiful to have you uh, here great you, to catch up with you, you again yeah. Yeah. thanks for coming by dude Ras right, Muhammad you. you're right. have a beautiful uh, day yeah, night people wherever you are <laughs> you replay that rooftop session <laughs> you. thanks man awesome ah, thank you man yeah. thank you <laughs> yeah